morning, everyone. It is our great honor to have Dr. Jeffrey Hewins to be here with us. Um, Jeff, thank you for being with us. It's my pleasure. Uh, first, could we ask, uh, what is real and what does real do? Okay. Uh, real, perhaps the best way to answer this is to say why reform real, because I think that'll give you some sense. Way back in the 1980s, the Illinois and the Midwest economies were undergoing rapid transformation. Manufacturing jobs were declining. Uh, everybody was feeling very pessimistic about the future. And the problem was a lot of people were trying to think what to do, but didn't have any really under good understanding about how the Illinois and the Midwest economies worked. So I had met um, a young man by the name of Philip Israelovich at a series of conferences. At that time, he was in the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, but he had the opportunity to move to the Chicago Fed. And so he took it, and we started interacting on a regular basis. And we thought that uh, it might be good to join forces, the Federal Reserve Bank's regional group and the University of Illinois, at that time we had a very active regional science program, so that we could perhaps develop some analytical tools that would help policymakers consider what options might exist for them and what types of uh, interventions they might make in terms of trying to reorientate the economy to the, uh, the new challenges. Uh, after some rather extensive negotiations, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank agreed that this would be a good idea. And on campus, we managed to persuade the Institute of Government and Public Affairs to be the host uh, of, of the operation. <clears throat> and so in January of 1989, these two august bodies uh, signed a document uh, that agreed to set, set real up. And um, we were then launched. And uh, the question you probably would ask next is, how do we come up with the name Real? Uh, well, very close to the uh, Federal Reserve Bank uh, was a hotel called the W Hotel, but a very nice bar. Um, and the attraction of that bar is it was the closest bar to the Fed. And so Phil and I went over there one afternoon and we started thinking we, we have to have some very catchy name mm -hmm. uh, because to brand this, yep. it's, it's, people can't refer to it as a joint venture between the Federal Reserve Bank and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. It doesn't have that nice mellifluous tones that, that people are going to remember. So uh, after about the second beer, we came up with mm -hmm. the name Real because we liked the fact that, that it was regional. Uh, it was economics and, most importantly, applications. Mm -hmm. And we wanted something to be a little bit different than a normal center, so we thought laboratory was a better name. Mm -hmm. uh, the other reason is, on this campus, uh, if you use something like institute or center, you have to have board of trustees' permission. Mm -hmm. If you use the word laboratory, you don't have to have anybody's permission, and I kind of like I like that a lot. And so uh, we also, uh, at that time, uh, developed the logo. And here are two guys who are input-output specialists, you know, think, dream, and uh, imagine the whole world could be represented in matrix form. So we came up with the, uh, the logo. And the initial logo um, uh, was essentially very simple, a nice four by four matrix. And along the principal diagonal, we had the words real. <laughs> okay. And uh, we kind of liked that. But uh, somewhat, some years later, mm -hmm. uh, some PR people uh, told us that it was a dreadful logo <laughs> and that we needed to change it. So we then ended up with the logo that mm -hmm. comes right now. So the gestation of this was 19. Um, 87, 88, and then in 1989, um, we had the formal uh, uh, signing of the agreement with the Federal Reserve Bank. And the idea was to develop analytical tools, particularly models, that would help us understand and interpret the Chicago economy, the Illinois economy, 
and eventually the Midwestern economy. Mm -hmm. And that's how we were launched. And we managed to persuade the Fed and the university to put in some money to enable us to hire a postdoc. And we were very fortunate to have um, available a person who just recently graduated from the University of Texas in uh, econometrics, uh, mm -hmm. Ramamon Mahidra. And Ram uh, joined us um, within a few weeks and started work uh, putting together the first model. And that was a collaboration with a um, person uh, from uh, Seattle, Richard Conway, who had developed um, one of the first econometric impedometer models. Mm -hmm. And Phil and I kind of liked that idea because most I.O. models that are dynamic are much too difficult to Im empirically implement. But by nesting the input-output system within an econometric framework, we were able to capture the ability to do impact analysis and forecasting. And those were the two things that we thought were very valuable. So we had a very intensive, probably three or four month period, where we collected data, um, empirically implemented the equations, and the Conway very nicely came to Chicago a couple of times and really helped us. And uh, we finally got a model up and running. And by the end of the year, we were starting to do impact analysis and, and forecasting. So for us, this was um, a very quick transformation because we wanted to essentially show both institutions that we could provide a return on their investment. And secondly, we wanted to become visible. And it was very interesting because when we started issuing some of the first analyses that we did, people in the community criticized us. Mm. And they said, why didn't we know about this? And the comment that both of us made is, academics have a very, very bad reputation. They often promise lots of, give me some money, I will develop analysis for you, I will do this and I will do that. And uh, basically two, three years go by and nothing happened. So we made the decision not to announce anything or do anything until we had a model up and running. And so first model was for the Chicago metro area. And then we, we started doing uh, analysis probably late 1989 into early 1990. Great. That's some really great history lesson. Thank you. Okay. Um, so could you also tell us a little bit about why do you call the real mafia? Why do we call it the real mafia? Well, in the beginning, there were a very small number of us. In fact, we fitted into two rooms in Davenport Hall. One of them was my office. And then we colonized the room next door. And we had a couple of um, PhD graduate students at that time, uh, uh, both of whom were Brazilian. Uh, Joaquim Guilherme, who I think you have probably known him at, and Manuel Fonseca, who <coughs> has visited here a couple of times since then, but now is in the Federal University um, of uh, Rio de Janeiro in, in Brazil, mainly a, a macro economist. Joaquim, much more regional economist. So they were in that lab, and uh, they worked uh, with us um, expanding uh, the models, graduated, and they left. And uh, then we uh, had a couple of next generation Brazilians, um, Eduardo Martins and Ricardo Gazelle, both of whom were from the state of Minas Gerais. And they were particularly intrigued about the possibility of uh, doing something very similar in Brazil. So that's when I took my first trip to Brazil. And we presented um, uh, what had then become a, a very nice Windows version of the model. So you could uh, enter some impacts, and it would run for you and present some nice graphic results. And behind it were 200 equations whirring. <laughs> but you didn't have to see the details. We ended up getting a contract, and so we had to hire more people. So we went from one office to another. We colonized another office across the hall. So I said, we're like the mafia. You know, we are infiltrating the whole building, and gradually things go on like this. You know, exponentially, we will take over the whole building. And uh, so we refer to each other as part of the mafia, and that and kind of resonated with people and they, they liked the, the notion. 
and so on, being called the real mafia um, had an even uh, more regal term. <laughs> Apparently the infiltration plans went really well. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about how many people have been involved in Rio and where do they come from? Okay, somewhere between four and five hundred, I wow. think. And this is, don't forget, 30 years. So um, it's kind of a long time. I would, I would say somewhere north of 30 countries have, have uh, been involved with some very strong concentrations. Brazil being one, uh, and in the last decade probably China uh, even even more prominently, but uh, I think it's it's been very diverse. And uh, I always tell people we have somewhere between five and ten countries represented in, in, in real. Sometimes it's more, but that seems to be a, a sort of a, a pretty pretty stable number. Uh, I think the the people who come are attracted by the possibility of spending just one year outside the country to have some international experience. And in fact, this idea was very attractive to the Brazilian government because their scholarship program um, was uh, not being very successful in the sense that people would come to the U.S., obtain a Ph.D., but not return. Mm -hmm. And so they uh, liked the idea of having something where the student would graduate in Brazil and uh, then return. And so we developed this Bolsa Sandwich, sandwich program mm -hmm. that now we've had over 30 people who have come. I've monitored the first 20, 19 of them have academic positions. One of them went back to the federal government from whence he came. Uh, and a number of them now are full professors. And in fact, I think uh, we have some grandchildren from this operation uh, that are going to join us next year. So we've had um, children and now we <coughs> we're going to have grandchildren. So these are third generation uh, people. And I think, I think it's been successful in the sense that a number of the students that I've talked to said spending four or five years outside was um, a little bit awesome, um, a little bit of a concern for them, uh, but one year was really attractive uh, because it was not, not so disruptive. And the nice thing is they, they go back to Brazil and that has really helped expand the human capital in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And um, the funding agency, uh, I just recently got in touch with the person who's in charge of this and was not aware of it. He had only seen the incremental applications, but had not had a sense of how many people had been supported mm -hmm. and the fact that it went back. And so we are going to have a, a meeting later this year and see whether we can expand this to other disciplines. Mm -hmm. So he wants to learn a little bit about our success. And then the second um, possibility, depending on what happens in the election in Indonesia, if all goes well and the current president is reelected. I think they're at a position where Brazil was 20 years ago that a number of the institutions like the University of Indonesia now have a lot of faculty with PhDs from outside the country. So they can offer uh, coursework which is of a quality that would match mm -hmm. uh, a lot of places in the U.S. And then the students come here and do their, their one year and then go back. So in addition to the Bolsa Sandwich program, we have uh, now help develop clones of real. First one was in Antofagasta in Chile, the Universidad Católica del Norte. And uh, secondly, we had Nereus mm -hmm. in the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, uh, Regio Lab in the uh, University of Oviedo, the uh, City Ready Regional Economic Development Institute at the University of Birmingham in the UK, and a year ago, uh, the first one in China, China Rio, mm. at um, uh, Nankai University in Tianjin, uh, which coincidentally was the first Chinese university I visited 30 years ago. So mm. it's kind of nice that there's this connection. And of course, the University of Birmingham is where I was an undergraduate. Um, but I never thought that when I was graduating there that this thing would happen. But 
it's sort of very nice to go back to a place mm -hmm. in a very, very different role. Um, and I think that over time we'll, we'll see a couple of more um, mm -hmm. developing. Sandy Deleber is working on the possibility of one in uh, Aguas Calientes in Mexico at a place called CIDE, mm -hmm. which um, I think would be very good because it's a very prestigious, uh, high quality economics research institute in the center of, of Mexico. So I think in, in that sense, um, our reach is both in terms of the people who come here, mm -hmm. but now um, uh, the mafia that is based elsewhere are deciding they want to have something that's very similar in terms of replicating it. And the other part that I think is very, very helpful is for the last 15 years, the, the European alumni have gathered uh, something we call e Real, which is an annual two-day event where people get papers and we have a chance to, to socialize. And in Tianjin in February, we will have the third China Real version of this. Mm. So that's very encouraging. And um, several people in South America have talked about trying to replicate uh, something very similar. The problem is that uh, airfares are very expensive at the moment. And South American, it would be, I think, very difficult to get people together. Nice. Thank you. Um, so over the past 30 years, um, what would you say is the most impressive thing that have happened? Okay. In terms of what, what I'm most proud of, I think, is being able to show that it is possible to have a research institute where high-quality professional work can go on at the same time people can develop very strong personal relationships. And I think that's one thing that really differentiates social science from the hard sciences. And I think I told many people that the, the sort of the metaphor for real came from watching the environment in which my wife worked as a PhD student. And in particular, having professors and students in one lab, having a chance to, to talk about their work and other things too. Um, but in particular, I, I felt that in social science, we didn't do this. People went into offices and they closed doors. And the idea of having um, a social component to it and having people have a chance to interact, I think has been very important. And it, 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 it really pleases me to see how these collaborations work. And a couple of years ago, the group in Europe were very successful in getting in a European Union Horizon 2020 project. And four of the participating universities in Spain, Portugal, uh, the United Kingdom, and Italy were led by uh, real mafia. So the fact that they, they met here, they interacted here, I think was something that spilled over in terms of their, their future collaboration. So I think, I think probably that, um, and the fact that uh, the atmosphere in real seems to perpetuate itself. People change, but the atmosphere changes. Sometimes, you know, it takes a month or two as new people come in, but um, I think there's a very, very comfortable, welcoming feeling about the place, and I think people uh, respond to that, and I think they like the fact that when they go back, they're going to have started the formation of their own international network that they can build on in, in future years. And it's always very comforting to me to go to professional meetings and have people say, oh, the mafia want to get together for dinner tonight. Can we, can we do this? So it starts off with eight or 10 people, but usually there are 30 or 40 by the time the evening is over. And I think that, that's, that's a sort of reflection of um, uh, a commitment for people to sustain something that I think they really enjoyed while they were here. So, yeah, I feel very, very good about that part. One of the enduring memories of Rio Mafia would be the cement shoes. Can right. you tell us a bit more about that? Well, I, I've always threatened people that if they didn't get things done, that uh, would be hell to pay. Um, but that was not a credible threat, because I'm probably one of the smallest people in Rio consistently. Uh, I'm not physically overpowering. Um, so I decided that uh, uh, I would offer them an, an option with uh, that the 
Italian mafia will provide. And cement shoes is one of the uh, um, most prominent ways that, particularly featured in Chicago, um, for getting rid of undesirable people. And a couple of three, four years ago, um, you guys surprised me with a birthday present for these shoes, which now figure very, very prominently uh, right outside the door here. And um, I, while I was in China recently, I showed pictures of these to a couple of people who were intending to come here, and they were a little alarmed <laughs> at the prospect that if they didn't perform very well, that they, they might be invited to try them on. But it's, it's a sort of a very nice joke, and it's a metaphor that I think people uh, understand. It has absolutely no credibility or no um, really considered threat, but it um, is a reminder that uh, particularly those coming from outside, that they're not engaged in scientific tourism. And the, there is a serious part to real, and I think being reminded now and again that you're here to do research I think is important. Rio has gone a long journey over the past 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like it has achieved uh, Rio's initial goals, or do you feel like there are um, upcoming challenges in the future? Okay. Um, yeah, we've, we've faced a number of challenges. I think um, the biggest challenge in the first decade was the death of Philip Israelovich. Um, he passed away at 49. Uh, from from cancer, and that was a huge blow because um, he and I became really close personal friends and professional friends and colleagues, and uh, his presence in the Federal Reserve Bank uh, was very important. And with his death, the relationship with the Fed uh, was much much more difficult because there was not a very strong advocate inside, and so. Um, in the post 9-11 period, the Fed became very nervous about having a relationship with the university because it was not a federal uh, operation. And so that, that um, we agreed that we would not uh, talk about it as a collaborative venture after, I think, 2004. We, we still collaborate with the people there, but it, uh, it, it was not a comfortable relationship. But in, in some ways, it was also an opportunity for us to perhaps be a little bit more adventurous and, uh, and aggressive in terms of the, the types of things we did and the types of projects that we, we could work on. Because I was always very concerned about not wanting to embarrass the Fed. Mm -hmm. And now and again, they would become a little uncomfortable. For example, when we did uh, a study of the impact of the uh, gambling industry, they didn't like that. They loved it when we we did the impact of the Monet art exhibition because um, it was cultural and it had a, a much higher cachet. Uh, so that that was I think I think that was very hard for us to to um, to accommodate. And then we had some losses of cognate faculty in urban planning, geography, and economics that made uh, the sort of set of people that we can interact with um, much, much smaller, and therefore limiting the opportunities. But there were, fortunately, uh, with a large institution, there are still a huge number that remain. Um, and uh, I think it, it has not diminished the, the quality of the, the training among the PhD students, but what it did do is limit the, uh, the number of people who could actively participate in, in doctoral dissertations and so forth. So that, that, was, that was a little bit of a challenge. I think, I think we've been successful, but probably um, a number of people would look at the metrics in terms of uh, how many people are involved mm -hmm. and how much grant money we bring in and things of that kind. And um, for probably half of our time, I have been the only full-time faculty member. And that has made it very, very difficult to um, really build uh, a more elaborate organization. But I'm not sure that that's necessarily bad or important. I think having 
two or three more people involved might have been attractive. But I think that the operation of real I think has generated its own momentum and that I think the idea of whoever's running the place now is more some guidance rather than having to come in and mush it. I, I, somebody asked me, well, how many, how, many, how many committee meetings do you have? And I, I don't think we've ever had one. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a structure that I want to look like any other departmental structure where there will be committees. We have informal groups, you know, somebody organizes um, the Arreos meeting, somebody organizes a poster party, and, you know, things of this kind. But it, I think the bureaucracy has been pretty well minimized. And a lot of it you guys have not been aware of because I've absorbed that so that uh, you've, you've not had to, uh, to experience some of the, uh, the mundane aspects of, of running an operation like this. I think probably if we were, if we had uh, a broader group of people, we might have been more effective in uh, attracting additional external resources. But again, that was never my goal. Uh, having numbers and having large amounts of money uh, was not important because at, at some point you spend too much time as a grant administrator and that, that's not very healthy. So I would say our goal was to enhance the quality of public policy decision making. I think we have done that, but whether that public policy decision making has been enhanced in terms of our people in Illinois may, in, in terms of government, in terms of policy makers, making better decisions. That's an open question and I'll leave somebody else to come back and look at that. What are your hopes for the future of Rio? Okay. And as of Rio is your child that is already 30 years old. Mm -hmm. So what words will you give it? Okay. Um, I think, my, well, my, my objective over the next five years is to, um, to try to enhance the, um, the permanent fiscal resources available to real, and to do that by uh, trying to raise some endowment funds. And, you know, yesterday in Chicago I was talking to, to somebody about, about that. I think it's very important that whoever runs real has access to um, a permanent source of funding. And I think that's very important for its sustainability. Um, because if, if something happened um, to, to me or to Sandy, then I'm not quite sure that absent some financial incentives that any of the collaborating departments would see it in their best interest to, to sustain it. So it's always been a concern that it's, it's operating on a very, very fragile uh, administrative base. And having financial resources to back it, I think, would help, uh, I think, increase the probability that, that it would be sustained. So that's um, where I see my efforts over the next four or five years. I think the research is going to continue. I think the activities are going to continue. That's not a problem but I think the source of funding is probably a, a bigger issue. It's not something that you guys are probably aware about or worried about, um, but uh, it is something that uh, both Sandy and I are very, very concerned about, that we, we have the ability to sustain it and pass it on to, to somebody five, ten years from now.